It's been a pleasure over the last couple of days to get to meet so many young and otherwise people in Israel who are interested in the kind of thing that Bob has been talking about for all these years. Um, I'm going to try to add a little bit to what he has done to talk about uh, some examples of how government policy can go disastrously wrong and then the connection between how you interpret the error in the policy uh, to proceed from then on because in the United States we created a disastrous policy we then interpreted it when it failed and caused the financial crisis we interpreted it the wrong way we interpreted it as the you might say the left wants that interpretation to be made. It was a fault of the government's regulation of the financial system rather than the policy that caused the problem. And that caused yet more problems in the economy. So for those of you who are interested simply in public policy, um, leaving aside whether it has to do with housing or anything else, what is important is to understand you have to use your talents, your skills, your intellectual abilities to analyze why a problem arose. And then once you've analyzed it, you've got to make sure that policies, or to the extent you can, that policies are adopted by the government after the crisis occurs that resonate um, that are the result of a well-devised analysis of why the policy had the effects it had. Now, that's a book. This uh, Hidden in Plain Sight is a book that I've written about the financial crisis in the United States. I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm talking really more about why it went disastrously wrong and why it was then misinterpreted by the, by the groups in power uh, to create more problems in the future. We haven't yet, as you will see, gotten out of the situation we've created oursel for ourselves through our housing policies. Um, but I'll have to introduce housing in the United States, housing policy in the United States to you uh, so you can understand what, what actually happened here. And it's complicated, so if you, if you will bear with me for just a little while, I will try to explain the, st the basic structure of the housing finance system that we follow in the United States. Although the United States is generally regarded as a free market kind of place, housing, po housing policy is an exception. This is something that is controlled by the government. And so what I like to do is to compare what housing policy has done, what effect is it, it has had, uh, with what a free market would do um, and, has, and is doing in other parts of the US economy. So let's start first with the basics of housing policy. The American people, and I, and I understand now since I've been in in uh, Israel for a while, I understand that the sentiments about housing are about the same, and that is Israeli people want to own homes, Americans want to own, own homes. And our government responding to that idea um, has developed over time a large number of policies that are intended to subsidize home ownership or help people own homes. Um, the, the most important of those policies are two government-backed agencies, which I will call Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are the kind of the nicknames that have been adopted for these companies. They have longer kind of government titles, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the ones you should keep in mind. They are backed by the government, as I said. Whatever liabilities they incur, um, are, will be supported by the government, paid off by the government in case they 
become insolvent, and they did in 2008, and everyone who had lent money to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, before the financial crisis was paid off by the taxpayers of the United States to the extent of $187 billion, which sounds like a lot, but in the United States, con considering we have, trillion, we have trillions in do of dollars of obligations, this is just a relatively small amount, but it's something that the taxpayers did not want to have to pay for. What do Fannie and Freddie do? Fannie and Freddie buy mortgages from originators. An originator is a bank or any other kind of institution that makes mortgages, not all of them banks in the United States. They, they were originally formed for the simple purpose of providing more liquidity to originators to make more mortgage loans. So that if a mortgage, if an originator, a bank, makes a series of loans, if it sells the loans to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, it gets cash back, giving it the cash to make yet more mortgages. So you can see right away that this is a way of enhancing the home ownership rate in the United States. Now, we ran into difficulties with our policies because home ownership in the United States was not increasing. In the year 1965, just to choose a year, um, in the year 1965, the home ownership rate in the United States it was 64%. In 1990, if you looked at the home ownership rate in the United States, it was 64%. In other words, all of the subsidies that we have been pouring into housing in the United States did not result in more people owning homes. Same, same numbers between 1965 and 1990. So there developed the idea that the reason that the home ownership rate was not rising in the United States is that there was a whole lot of people, a great number of people in the United States who could not afford to buy homes because the underwriting standards were too tough. What is an underwriting standard? In the United States, just for simple way of describing it, an underwriting standard would involve a down payment, usually 10%, a good credit score, which meant that you had a record of paying your bills, and the third item was a debt to income ratio that did not exceed 38%. What is a debt to income ratio? It means after that you've bought the house, the mortgage is now your obligation, all of your debt obligations are not greater than 38% of your total income. Those are the three elements of what was known as a prime mortgage. And that's what Fannie and Freddie did from the time they were established until about 1992. They imposed those underwriting standards. In fact, they were known for doing that. But Congress was persuaded by, a, by people who were pressing for more mortgages to be made to people uh, at or below median income. In other words, um, low or moderate income borrowers or families. Um, Congress was pressing for, or, or activists were pressing for some kind of action from Congress that would change this. And they argued that this would mean, this would change this problem of housing ownership, home ownership increasing year by year, uh, failing to increase year by year. They would, it would change this, th they would change this problem by making making mortgages available to people below median income. And so Congress adopted something called the Affordable Housing Goals in 1992. And that was to provide more affordable housing to people at or below median income. And that was the way to solve the problem of home ownership in the United States. That would be finally a way 
to increase home ownership when it had not increased over the 24, 25 years from 1965. What did it do? Just look, let's look first just at the top line. We don't have to look at the other ones at this point. We won't talk much about those. But the top line shows you what was required. In 1992, the, the law that was adopted, the Affordable Housing Goals, required that when Fannie and Freddie bought mortgages from originators, banks, and others, at least 30% of those mortgages had to be made to people who were at or below median income. Now, it happens that in 1992, about 30% of all the people whose mortgages Fannie were buy was buying were beyond, below um, median income. Um, but the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is a part of the United States government, was given the authority to increase these uh, requirements. And so by um, 20, uh, I'm sorry, by 1994, 1995, they had increased their requirement to 40%. And you can see that in the black line above. And as the black line increased, it increased to 56% in 2008. So in 2008, 56% of all mortgages that were bought by Fannie and Freddie had to be made to people who were at or below median income. The problem with this, and probably a problem that Congress did not understand when they adopted it in the first place, was that it was very hard to reconcile the underwriting standards the prime mortgage underwriting standards that Fannie and Freddie had always used with the idea that they had to make, they had to buy loans that were made to people who were at or below median income. It turned out that many people below median income could not meet a 10% down payment, did not have good credit scores, did not have a 38% loan to value ratio when after the mortgage was closed. So here's Fannie and Freddie required by the government to buy mortgages made to people who were at or below median income and they found they couldn't find many of those mortgages as long as they retained the underwriting standards that they had used in the past. So they began to reduce their underwriting standards and the first reduction that they made. Well, let me, let me step back just for a moment so you understand what you're looking at here. This, the, the black line, is the requirements. The red and green lines are what Fannie and Freddie did to comply with the requirements. And so you can see that they followed the regulations as required. The, the two sets of lines just below that are for what were called special goals. They had to comply with these two, but they were lower, somewhat lower. The one, the one just below is for underserved categories, and those were basically um, African American and Hispanic neighborhoods. And the bottom line, special affordable, these were people whose incomes were 60% of the median income. So they were very low income families. Um, and Fannie and Freddie had to comply with all of those at the same time. So we get back to what they were doing. They found that it was very difficult for them to find prime mortgages among the people they were required uh, to, whose mortgages they were required to buy. So they reduced their underwriting standards. What's the effect of that? So I can find the right thing that I hit just a moment ago. Um, this shows you where things went after the affordable housing uh, policies were adopted. The blue on the left are Fannie and Freddie. Um, the red just above that is another government agency called the Federal Housing Administration. And the, I guess that's green above that. Those were some other government agencies. So they were making most of the loans they were buying most of the loans that were being made in the United States to people who were at or below median income. 
on the right, the black box, that's the private sector. So if you were wondering where most of the low quality mortgages, the ones that were riskier because they were made to people who did not have substantial financial resources, who was making those loans, who was buying those loans, primarily it was the government agencies. And in fact, just before the financial crisis, 76% um, of all of the subprime or other weak mortgages in the economy were made by these government agencies. More than half of all mortgages in the U.S. economy in 2008 were subprime or otherwise weak mortgages, in other words, with low down payments and things like that. 76% of those, 76% of that majority, um, were held by government agencies. So what we know from that data alone is that it was the government who had created the demand for those. Now that was not because of anything other than the affordable housing goals. This just shows you, this is an excerpt from a report that was issued by Fannie Mae itself um, in 2008. It had been taken over by the government because it was insolvent. Um, the mortgages it had made had become um, uncollectible. Um, and so Fannie and Freddie became, in effect, insolvent. Their liabilities exceeded their assets substantially. And here they're reporting for the first time, incidentally. They had not reported this before. But for the first time, they're reporting, in effect, that they had about $838 billion of these low-quality mortgages on their balance sheets or were otherwise exposed to those mortgages. This was entirely new. No one had known this before because Fannie and Freddie had never reported um, that they were buying these low-quality mortgages. People assumed that somehow they were complying with the affordable housing goals, but they were not buying mortgages that were subprime. Did I get it? Yes. Okay, now, what is, it, what is the effect of a subprime or lower quality mortgages, uh, mortgage on the financial system? This is data that was prepared by Robert Schiller, who's a well-known professor at Yale, and it shows an enormous bubble, housing price bubble, that began in about 1997 and continued until about 2007. How did that happen? Well, let's talk just simply about down payments. If you have a 10, 000, if you've saved $10,000 to buy a home, and the underwriting standard, as it was in the United States, is 10% at least, sometimes 20%, you could buy a $100,000 home. But if the underwriting standard is reduced to 5%, which is what Fannie and Freddie had to do in order to find the mortgages that they were required to buy, then you can buy a $200,000 home. The same $10,000 then is 5% of the $200,000 home. And so how did, you, how did you buy it? You bought it by borrowing $190,000 instead of just $90,000. And the result, the two results of this the first is you are a much weaker credit because now, whatever your income is, you've now borrowed $190,000 instead of $90,000. So you're much more indebted. And the second thing is that there's a lot of credit chasing houses. And so you can begin to understand that that would cause housing prices to rise, just supply and demand. Much more demand, much more, many more dollars chasing whatever housing stock was available. So that caused this tremendous growth in housing prices between 1997 and 2007. I'm going to show you now a, a few different ways of looking at the same bubble because it's quite interesting to understand that this is quite an outlier in the United States. Most things, as I said before, most things in the United States are done on a market basis. 
individuals or consumers of other kinds, negotiating with suppliers and sellers and buyers, all negotiating over prices. So here's, the, here's what the housing market looked like when you compare housing prices to, say, construction costs. Construction costs is a standard kind of economic um, system where buyers and sellers, sellers compete with one another, buyers uh, bargain with the sellers, and you get a basically stable price. And that is from 1980 all the way to 2012, basically stable. The uh, affordable housing goals, however, forced housing prices up during this period, over, up to 10% a year, up to until 2007. Um, housing was not, the construction business and housing, uh, the housing business were not outliers in any sense. I mean, this was, this was, um, all other businesses in the United States remained in the way that businesses always were, and that is very competitive and very stable. So housing prices were really outliers. And here we have another example. These are real um, new car prices in the United States between 1967 and 2015 based on the median income of Americans. So you can see that this is a very competitive business, and as a result, uh, the prices of the automobiles kept pace with the, what Americans could afford to, play, to pay, unlike the housing business, where it was quite out of line with what Americans could afford to pay. But this is a stable market, the kind that occurs always when free markets are uh, allowed to operate. Um, I want to show you the housing market under the same conditions, and that is the home prices um, in terms of the median income of Americans. And again, you can see that we had this terrible bubble that we had between 1997 and 2007 was true even in terms of the median income of American families. This chart shows you fundamentally what happened um, in the market after 2007. It was a complete collapse. This is not actually the whole market. This is only a sector of the market. Those private mortgage-backed securities, that is, securities that were sold based on pools of mortgages that were created by private organizations. They create a pool and sell securities Based on that pool, the holders of those securities would receive a portion of the principal and interest that was paid into the pool. And that was a very vital and growing market until 2007. When we reached 2007, what effectively happened is that no matter how concessionary the, the financing was, regrettably, um, people couldn't buy homes anymore. And as a result, the bubble topped out and began to fall. And as it begins to fall, it acquires some momentum. As you can see, that's because people are no longer able, as they were in the United States, and still are in the United States, able to refinance their mortgages. If you had a mortgage that you couldn't meet in the United States without any cost, you can refinance that mortgage. You can extend it from 15 years to 30 years, or whatever it is that would put you in a position where you can pay it. But if the prices for homes are falling, you can't refinance. And as a result of that, many people just failed. And in the United States, again, policies are trying to encourage home ownership. So in most states of the United States, if you can't meet your mortgage obligation, you just take your keys, you put them in the mailbox, and you walk away and the bank has to get whatever it can for the value of the loan. That's in, it's called jingle mail for obvious reasons. Um, you just put the keys in the box and walk out and you're free 
of any further obligation. The bank suffers all of the losses. But this is a good way to look at what actually happened in the United States when the mortgage prices topped out. So what did we do after we had this financial crisis in 2008? Well, we elected a new president because the American people were very frightened about what happened. They did not understand why this had happened. And a Barack Obama said in the debates with John McCain, who was his opponent in 2008, he said, well, this was the result of deregulation. We shouldn't have had so much deregulation. Um, so Obama was elected, and he adopted several policies that were intended to address uh, the problems associated with the mortgage collapse that occurred. Um, the first was the Economic Recovery Act, which was adopted in 2009, his first year in office. And that was about $800 billion poured into the US economy, essentially for infrastructure. Um, under a Keynesian analysis, that should have helped the economy recover. All the new money being poured in should have gotten the economy going. Another policy of Obama was the Affordable Care Act, which probably you've heard about, called Obamacare in the United States. And it was a health insurance system. It poured another $1.5 trillion of federal subsidies into the market. Should have helped, should have helped the recovery. The third was quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve, which economists have estimated about and putting about $4.2 trillion into the US economy. So all of those things should have caused a strong recovery. But the fourth item that was adopted under Obama's administration was the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which we call the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States. And this was the most restrictive law on the financial system since the Depression in the 1930s. There were about 400 regulations, new regulations, of the financial system that were required by this act um, and, in fact, are still on the books. Many of them have not been made since Obama went out of office, but about three quarters of them were made, these regulations, while Obama was in office under his pressure uh, to administrative agencies and regulatory agencies under his, under his authority. So what did this all result in? Despite all of the funds that were poured into the US economy in the Obama administration to resolve the problem of caused by the financial crisis, we can see here that the, the recovery from the financial crisis was the slowest since the mid-1960s from any recession that we had during that period. So the black line in the middle of the shaded area is the average of all recoveries. The red line way at the bottom is the, uh, the recovery during the Obama administration. The result, I believe, no one can prove this, but as a result, I think, of the regulations that Obama put into place and Congress adopted. And so here's where we get to the point where the interpretation of the policy becomes important. If you interpret what happened in 2008 as the result of insufficient regulation of the financial system, then you put new regulations into place. If you understand that it was caused by the housing policies that had been in force before, um, then you would perhaps change the housing policies. But that is not how the debate went in the United States. Uh, Obama was elected. A Democratic Congress was elected. Both of them imposed much tougher regulation on the theory that the financial crisis had been caused by insufficient regulation. So here we have a good picture of where the United States housing economy is today. And you can see, again, the same uh, bubble between 1997 and 2007. 
Then you see it collapse in 2008, and now you see uh, a substantial increase in housing prices, just like what occurred before 2008. The difference is that now the data that we have at AEI um, enables us to disaggregate the lowest uh, cost homes from the medium cost loans and the high cost loans. And what we are able to determine is that the lowest cost homes for the people, for the families who are trying to buy their first home, those prices went up fastest, not only in the initial bubble, but after the bubble crashed and then uh, housing prices began to uh, rise again, again for the very people that the affordable housing goals were intended to help, those people were hurt the most. And you can see it in the data right here on the chart. Um, they are facing the most, the highest rate of increase in housing prices compared to people who have higher incomes and the highest income. All of those groups, although they are facing higher costs for homes, it's not as bad as exactly the people who are trying to get on the housing ownership um, merry-go-round, if you will, and, oh, and buy their first home so they can begin then to move up as their circumstances improve. So here's the, here's, uh, the precise point that anyone should understand about this. First, we had a bad policy. We created a policy that caused a huge bubble. When the bubble collapsed, we had a financial crisis. But we blamed the financial crisis on something entirely different from what actually had caused it. We blamed it on the lack of regulation, insufficient regulation of the banks and other financial institutions. And so we left in place the entire housing policy system that had actually caused the problem in the first place. And so we are now facing exactly the problem that we faced in the early 2000s, running up to 2008. So that's the, that's the point I want all of you to understand. There are several things in here. First of all, housing policies by the government uh, can be destructive. And in the United States, they were destructive. Then if we're not honest about analyzing why we had such destructive policies, and we choose the wrong examples and the wrong reasons for why we had these destructive policies, the same policies remain in effect. And they are going to cause exactly the same problem at some point in the future, unless we come to our senses and begin to remove the government from uh, the housing finance business in the United States. And if we are successful in doing that, if President Trump understands all this, and begins to take the government out of the housing system, which in fact he can do without legislation. He can do it legislatively. Uh, I'm sorry, administratively. He can, he can do it on his own. Um, we would then have a housing finance system that is very much like the automobile financing system, or the construction system, or the sale of laptop computers, or food. All of these major businesses in the United States are run on a completely free market basis. Regulations, of course, about how uh, safety and health, all very important. But otherwise, the government stays out of the pricing mechanism in these markets. It's only in the housing market where the government actually affects the housing mechanism, and we see what happens when it does. So that's the point I think I'd like all of you to come away with. And now I'd love to have an opportunity to take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Uh, I read somewhere that uh, Adam Greenspan in some point of time admitted that the deregulation process was a mistake in some level. And uh, I asked myself, myself if uh, he didn't uh, did that long process of deregulation, maybe uh, that can be a helpful uh, process that eliminated the chance of getting uh, another crisis for the development. What Greenspan said, actually, was he was surprised that companies would take the risks that they were taking. Um, he uh, kind of assumed that boards of directors of companies, managements of companies um, that had capital, in other words, something to risk, um, would take the kinds of risks that they took to create the financial crisis, to buy the mortgages that were so weak and risky. Later on, he, like so many people in the United States who were actually willing to listen to the facts and understand the data, began to realize what happened, actually, in the housing finance system. He happens to be someone I know pretty well, and I met with him many times, and we talked about this, and I showed him a lot of data. And I think his view would be completely different now. He understands why. Um, housing prices began to rise that way, and he understands why companies took those risks. W number one, when a, when a bubble is growing, when housing prices are going up 10% a year, the risks for lenders are much lower than you might imagine when you look at it afterward. Um, to them, do you make a loan and the house is going to be worth 10% the next year, even if the person you made the loan to doesn't pay anything, you can probably take the house back and sell it for more and not suffer any significant loss. So that was one thing that I don't think a lot of people really understood. Didn't under they didn't understand the effect of the, the bubble going up. Another factor was that as these loans were being made, they were paying very well because they were risky loans, and so they bore a reasonably high interest rate, higher than the normal interest rate, um, and there were no defaults. If you understood the U.S. mortgage system, you would understand why there weren't any defaults, or very, very few, because if you come to the point in the United States where you can't meet your mortgage, uh, mortgage obligations, you can refinance free of charge. You go to another bank, the other bank picks up your mortgage, extends your mortgage for another 10 years, and you have a much lower monthly payment, and therefore you can afford to keep the home for a while, as long as refinancing is available. When housing prices fall, as I said, you can no longer refinance, so that's when the, the mortgages began to fail in enormous numbers. And then third, people looking at the U.S. housing market over a half century um, could cite the fact that there, were, there was never a significantly large uh, decline in home prices. Three to four percent was the most that we'd ever had. And even in those cases, um, it was mostly a regional matter where oil prices had fallen so in Texas, there were a lot of defaults, that kind of thing. This was an, a completely different thing. Housing prices in the United States nationally fell 30 to 40 percent, which was completely unprecedented. And people didn't expect that. So it's understandable, really, why companies took the risk. And from the standpoint of people on Wall Street who got most of the blame for what happened, they were doing what Wall Street does, and that is when people come to them and say, I want some of these mortgages. I can see what advantages there are here, financial advantages to me, and I want some of these mortgages. Get them for me, and I'll buy them. And that's what Wall Street did. They responded to that demand. So, yeah, um, it, looks, it looked peculiar at the beginning, and when, when Alan Greenspan was called before Congress to explain this, he did say, well, I, I just, this doesn't fit in with anything I ever understood about how managements operate. But I think now he understands much better. And if were he called before Congress again, he would probably say exactly what my book says happened in the financial crisis. 
Yes. Uh, should we quickly talk about how the, the risky mortgages were packaged with better products to, to manipulate the credit rating? And, and how has that been addressed since it was discovered? Um, I wouldn't say that they manipulated the credit rating. Um, they did package mortgages from all over the country into the same pool. I mentioned before uh, what, what a mortgage-backed security is. It's based on a pool of mortgages. And they would uh, move, put into a pool mortgages from all over the country because that provided diversification. Some of those mortgages were low-quality mortgages. Some of the mortgages were high-quality mortgages. And the buyers of the mortgage-backed securities had a choice. They could take the top level of the structure, which was rated a triple A, um, which was the least risky of all, um, and they would get paid first. If any money came into the pool, they got the first money. Then below that was a level of that uh, took the next loss, if there was one, and below that, an even riskier level, and below that, an even riskier level. So it's not exactly true that the mortgages were divided themselves among risky and non-risky mortgages. What happened was that all the mortgages were treated the same way, but some people bargained for the triple A category, which was about 85% of uh, the full amount in the pool. And that meant that if, if losses did not exceed 15%, you got paid out entirely. But if losses exceeded 15%, um, not only did the people at the bottom lose all of their money, but some of the people who had triple A, um, uh, the triple A tranches, what we call tranches, um, didn't get fully paid out. So it, it's not really true that anyone was fooled by how many uh, different kinds of mortgages were in these pools. This was well known to investors, and most of the investors were very sophisticated institutions. They knew exactly the risks they were taking. The people who were not taking the AAA risk were getting paid more. And the lower in the scale that you were, if you were down at the bottom with the equity portion of these, these um, things, you would get a lot of money, a lot of uh, return, if there were no losses. But if there were losses, you were wiped out. Um, but the mortgages were mixed of all different kinds. And everyone who bought one of these mortgage-backed securities saw exactly what the mortgages were, all the categories. Uh, all the characteristics of these mortgages from the top to the bottom. So they could run their own numbers and determine whether this was some, a risk they wanted to take based on the reward they would get for taking the risk. So of course, the AAA groups um, got much lower return, but they were protected by the fact that there was a group below them and below that group and below that group who were going to take the losses if there were any. It happened that we had 30 to 40 percent decline in mortgage values in the United States. And so, of course, the losses crept up into the AAA sectors. But it wasn't solely because they were subprime mortgages. It was simply because um, no one thought that losses would be that great. And so people suffered losses even when they bought uh, the AAA tranches of these mortgage-backed securities. Does that answer the question that you had? The yeah, so, so basically, so the subprime mortgages, the, or, so, or the, so the housing bubble also affected the ability of people who, who had prime mortgages to pay, make their monthly payments or, or to refinance. Yeah. Even but, to begin with, you yes. The, the fundamental problem was not prime mortgages or subprime mortgages. It was that most people did not know that there were so many subprime mortgages in the financial system. Um, and the reason they didn't know that, let's go back to this. See, 
These are subprime mortgages held by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, Federal Housing Administration, and other government agencies. Um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who were the major holders, did not disclose that they were buying subprime mortgages. Uh, they said in their materials they filed with the SEC, they were public companies and they filed with the SEC, materials they filed with the SEC said that our exposure to subprime mortgages is less than 1% or minimal. Whereas in fact, their exposure to um, subprime mortgages was something closer to 20%. So uh, there was a lot of um, lack of candor going on here, which is one of the reasons why many people who were looking carefully at the market did not understand how risky the market actually was. So the Federal Reserve, which is supposed to have, which has thousands of high quality PhD economists and has data about the entire economy, did not know how serious the subprime mortgage problem was. Uh, and Ben Bernanke, who was the head of the, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said in congressional testimony, as things were declining in the market, he said, well, subprime is not such a serious problem. It's controlled. It's, uh, it, it, it should not be worrisome to people because the number of subprime mortgages in our market is just not that great. And the reason he could make that statement is that the Federal Reserve itself did not know how many subprime mortgages Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and other government agencies were actually holding. Yes? Hi. Um, so the picture you painted at the end, and this in addition, excuse me, um, paint a um, unhealthy market picture for today, unless I'm missing something, which is that you said there was regulation that was poured on um, in 2009, 2010. Um, I don't think it changed what the government agencies were required to do um, in terms of their loan um, expectations. Right. And they focus on the banks. The banks have since restructured how they structure their mortgages and how they sell them slightly differently, but seems like they're relatively the same based on what I've read in the papers. So with this breakout, um, and the housing going up for the lower than median, um, uh, no, sorry, the, the, the cheaper houses, yeah, right. um, and the regulation not changing, do you see what happened recurring? And if not, why not? I do see what's ha what, what happened recurring again. Um, so we leave out the why not. <laughs> um, in fact, we are going to have another financial crisis because we are doing exactly the same thing. Uh, just as an example, uh, after the financial crisis, a Fannie and Freddie became insolvent. And they were taken over by their regulator as, the con as their conservator. And the conservator just is supposed to operate them and, and perhaps bring them back to financial health. The conservator who was put into place started to insist that they improve the quality of the mortgages that they were buying. He reinterpreted the affordable housing goals in a way that allowed him to reduce the number of low quality mortgages they were buying. And he insisted that they increase their down payments. A minimum of 5% down payment is what he was based uh, talking about. However, um, eventually, um, I won't go into all the details, but Pre President Obama was able to nominate his own um, uh, person to take that position as the conservator of Fannie and Freddie. And that person took the traditional position that people like President Obama and other um, r regulators or left people on, on the left would take in the United States, and that is they proposed to reduce underwriting standards again. So about a year and a half ago, 
Um, the new regulator of Fannie and Freddie said, I don't want you to do 5% five, 5 down payments. I want you to do 3% down payments. And that's what they did. They began to reduce their down payments even more. Now, why did they do that? Because the thinking of those people is that the way you help low and moderate income people buy homes is to reduce their underwriting standards and their down payments. But the effect it has is exactly the opposite. It makes those homes more expensive. And so after those decisions were made in about 20, I guess it was about 2016, early 2016, late 2015, the market started to go up again. Housing prices started to rise as underwriting standards reduced. Um, strangely, in our media and elsewhere, people celebrated. Housing prices are going back up. It's just great. Look at this. Prosperity is coming back. This is terrible news because housing prices, like everything else in our economy, should be stable. They should not go up and go down. They should be stable, just like construction costs, just like automobiles. They should be stable. But we don't have the, mar the kind of market, which is a free market, that produces stability. We have a market that is susceptible to these ups and downs caused by government policy. Yes, you want to add to that? Yeah, just one follow-up. Are there safeguards in place from the last 10 years of any kind that would restrict the banks or the government or HUD or whomever else from repeating reform? You said you expect it to happen. Are there any safeguards? That no. 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 Um, we haven't changed. We haven't learned the lesson. Um, we can because there are people in power now who have the ability to learn the lesson, but they haven't yet gotten to the point where they are willing to listen to how things should be changed. Yes? I was wondering if there are any other financial markets which run a similar risk, in which you see a similar worrying trend uh, of, a, of a different financial market which could potentially collapse because of over a uh, regulation or any other uh, process? No, I can't actually think of another financial market where this is likely to happen. Like people Equal. talk about derivatives, like financial derivatives as a potential. Right. And people talked about derivatives, in fact, before the financial crisis and after the financial crisis, and, they, and some people blamed derivatives. Let's talk about that for a, a little bit, um, not to get, I don't want to get into too much complication here, but I think the derivative that they are talking about is a credit default swap, which is a a kind of a form of insurance in which one company insures another company against losses for a fee of some kind. That's a credit default swap. And there was a lot, uh, there were many people after the financial crisis occurred who said, ah, it's these derivatives that have caused the problem. Well, the fact is that Lehman Brothers, which was the, the trigger event for the crisis when the Lehman Brothers company failed in September of 2008, the market just went to pieces, and I'll explain to you why that happened. But Lehman Brothers was a big player in the, in the credit default swap market, the so-called derivatives market. And nothing happened to the derivatives market. It functioned throughout the rest of the crisis without any difficulties. Now, there were some companies that got into trouble for behaving badly, if you will, in the derivatives market. AIG was the sort of the poster child for a company that did not work well with others in the derivatives market. They took only one side of the credit default swap. Normally, people who operate in that market take two sides. They hedge themselves, so they insure A, but they buy uh, uh, insurance themselves from B, so that if A fails, they've got coverage from B, and B buys from C, and so forth. So the market remains relatively balanced. AIG did not do that. 
they took only one side of the derivative, they insured a lot of people, and when these people had trouble, failed, AIG had a lot of paying out to do, and that's why they failed. So there, and, and the derivatives market today is operating perfectly well, with no problems. And it operated through the financial crisis, as I said, without any, any difficulty. And no major firm of any kind failed other than AIG, who misplaced itself in the, who, who misplayed its position in the, in the market, other than AIG, no other large company failed as a result of the derivatives market. So although it was blamed, and the media talked about credit default swaps bringing the economy to its knees, I mean, expressions like that, they know nothing. They never tried to find out what happened. Um, and statements like that circulated widely through the world, certainly in the United States, so that people actually believed and still believe that that was a cause of the crisis. It was not. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. So basically you were saying that um, uh, the crash will happen again at some point. Would you take the risk to say when that will happen no, again? No, I won't. <laughs> I know you guys want to sell short. <laughs> because, um, it, because it's clear that at some point it will go down. The only question yes. is when. If that will yes. happen in 100 years from now, I don't I, can, I cannot tell, but I mean you can generally get the picture that is, housing prices go up and up and up, and eventually, eventually, no matter how concessionary the lending is, um, no one can afford to buy a house, or very few people can afford to buy a house, and as a result, the prices top out and begin to decline, and once they begin to decline, all of the, um, all of the defaults start to come in because people can't refinance. So, that's where we're headed. You wouldn't even say in which range that was. <laughs> okay, five years. <laughs> uh, but I hope by that time we've been able to persuade Donald Trump and his Treasury Secretary and others that he can return the housing market. He can be a hero here. He can return the housing market in the United States to a perfectly well-functioning, private market, as stable as the automobile market, um, if he will just um, gradually eliminate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And he has the power to do that. Without big turbulence. Without, I'm sorry. Without big turbulence. I missed turbulence? Like without, without significant like turbulence. turbulence. Without turbulence. Yeah, without turbulence. That's right. I mean, what, what we've been proposing to Donald Trump his staff and to the Treasury Secretary and so forth, is if you do it gradually over time, you reduce their footprint in the market, it won't be turbulent at all. I mean, other entities will come in and take their place, private sector entities that will insist on good quality mortgages. And oddly enough, in a market like that, low and moderate income people will be able to buy homes because the United States economy supplies goods and services to everyone who wants to buy them. And so if you don't have a lot of money, you don't get a big house. You may not get three bathrooms or even two. You may not get 2,400 square feet. You might get 1,400 square feet. But that's the way the market works, and it should. And it is a stable market. So. That's what we're talking to Donald Trump about. Who sets the percentage of the down payment out of the total loan value? Right now, unfortunately, the government is setting the down payment. Before 1994? Before 1992, um, that, that was set by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They, were, they, they came out of a tradition in which the down payments were 10 to 20 percent, and they insisted on those. People looked at what they were doing and said, well, that's the reason that we don't have an increase in home ownership, because low and moderate income people can't meet the standards that, that uh, uh, Fannie and Freddie have, are using. 
So now we're just telling Fannie and Freddie, you don't have to reduce your standards, but we want you to make sure you buy a certain number of loans, a quota of loans from people who are at or below median income. And the effect of that was to force them to reduce their standards. That caused the bubble and we were off to the races. Okay, thank you, Bob.